Well, welcome, Maisa. Thank you, Rick. I'm excited to be here. I'm very, very excited. I think I'm more excited that this might be the very first <laughs> podcast webinar with Moscow Mules on it. Amazing. You know, <laughs> it's a happy drink. It's a happy, happy drink. Yeah, it's funny. I was talking yesterday, telling my uh, bartending stories from college, and today I got to play bartender again, so I, I almost feel like I, I fulfilled my stories yesterday. Where did you go to college? In New Orleans. Oh, yeah. wow. Well, gosh, there's a place to go to college. <laughs> yeah, I... Uh, <laughs> I, I had too much fun. Uh, I can imagine. Learned a lot. Yes. And, uh, you know, have you been in New Orleans? I have. I have. What do you think? I think it's a great, uh, culturally rich city. I actually, a funny story of my old career, uh, we used to, I used to do uh, representation of, of government tourism boards, and we worked for... Um, the state of Louisiana, oh, okay, actually, cool. and yeah. so uh, I, I just I love all of Louisiana, yeah. uh, but New Orleans in itself is just oh, it's, it's just so unique, incredible it? place. It's it's fabulous. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it's tough in the sense that like if, if you go into town for the weekend and you're not from there, you know you get kind of get sucked up in the French Quarter, and, there, totally. and there, there's a lot of great things in the French Quarter, but if you know lo locals, like yeah, I mean you really see a whole other side of the culture yeah. and the people and the scene and so living there for four years, you know, obviously I got deep on that and just loved it. Love it. Yeah. I don't think I'd ever move there again. I think yeah. it was like a place in time, great place to visit, going back in November with my wife. Oh, fun. And uh, yeah, when we just, the food is. The food is outstanding. The food is out of this yeah. world. Yeah, but if, unless you're in medicine, law, or tourism, there's just, there's not a lot of industry yeah. there, so yeah. I, I yeah. believe. Yeah, and it's going to, it's a tough place with climate change now, so. Yeah, I know. You know, I, I, it kind of scares me because when everyone, when we were out there, everyone was talking about the big hurricane, right? This yeah. This pre-Katrina. You know, we we don't know, uh, you know, if we know it's going to happen, we just don't know when. And then I come out here and I hear the same stuff with the earthquakes. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I just bought a bunch of wine. I was just in, in wine country and I was putting all these bottles up and they're expensive bottles, and I'm thinking to myself, I should probably move them down a little <laughs> bit because I'm going to get in trouble. But yes, I hear you, and now I think I'm going to go back to my house and put <laughs> them down a, a bit lower. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think Lo that's a good idea. <laughs> Love it. So, but you're not originally from California. I am not. Um, I, my family's from Argentina. Um, we moved quite a bit. I was actually born in Wisconsin and was okay. seen Wisconsin about an hour out from, from Chicago, uh, half an hour out from Milwaukee, and um, went back to Argentina. We moved a lot. Uh, moved back here to the States when I was 10. And um, yeah, I've been in Florida, in Mountain View when I was little. Okay. Uh, my dad went to Stanford, so you know we were just there for the ride. Oh, cool. um, and then, yeah, then the Midwest, the the Great Midwest. We went back to Wisconsin. Big difference uh, between Wisconsin and Argentina. Huge. Yeah. Huge. <laughs> I'd say so. and, yeah. When you're a fourth grader coming back, it's 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 tough, right? <laughs> it's <laughs> it's a tough one. But that that said, um, you know, I was able to get. Um, I think there's a resilience in, in the ability to move mm -hmm. and a, adjust and learn about people's personalities and um, how you enter in and, and, and how you listen to people. Yeah. And that's, I think, been kind of the, the, the core tenet for me on how I, on some of the things that I love in the work that I do. And I think par partner marketing is, is is right there, right? Is it's all about relationships. Mm. It's all about nuance, and it's really understanding how we can um, how we can connect yeah. and achieve the things that we're looking to achieve together. So, um, and and that's I, I learned that through moving and and going into areas where you don't know anybody, you feel very insecure, yeah. um, and you have to find that moxie to just go in and 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 listen first. Yeah. It, it's so true. So I've, I've lived in five different states, never lived anywhere internationally, but you know, I've, I've done it where you go into a new city and you don't know anyone. Yeah. And I remember I, when I first moved to Chicago, um, I, you know, I had the apartment, none of my stuff was there and I'm eating Subway on the floor of my empty <laughs> apartment all by myself. And it's, it's, it's scary. It's scary. It, it's freaky. And then you think, oh my gosh, how am I going to make friends? And yeah. And you think through all of that, 
Um, I remember we moved to Florida from Wisconsin uh, when I was a, the middle of my sophomore year of high school. And I'll tell you what, that is the scariest yeah. thing for anybody to go through. I think I was, you know, the, I thought my life was over. Yeah. And, you know, I made it work. And I ended up having the best time yeah. uh, out in West Palm. And, and, you know, I have great memories and great friends from, from there now. So, I love it. I love yeah. it. It's, you know, it gives you perspective. It does. Yeah. To that point, cheers. Cheers. Wanted to give you a <laughs> Moscow mule cheer. You have to let me know what you think. How are you, bar bartending school? Wow, very nice. <laughs> well done. It, it all came back. It was a college bar, so it was mostly <laughs> pouring beers and, and lots of shots. I did. I, I did work at a college bar. Yeah. The, the Touchdown Cafe. In, oh yeah. In Michigan. Yes. We were we were Friar Tucks. Friar Tucks. Oh, yeah. I've heard of Friar yeah. Tucks. It doesn't exist anymore. I think they turned into a sushi joint. Oh geez. But. Okay. That's <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, ours turned into a club. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, we were a sports it. bar. Yeah. So all right. So. I got to ask though, you must yeah. be a big Messi fan. Of course I am. Yes. Um, I, I went pretty crazy uh, when we won the game. Yeah. I scared the hell out of my daughter. Uh, <laughs> she started crying because I was screaming so loud. Oh, no. She had COVID. Um, oh. So she was, you know, not feeling great. And when we got that goal, I, I, I have it on video. I literally, oh. uh, it was crazy. Oh, that's um, great. Are you going to go see him play? Well, Miami, it's not far away, so yeah. I would love that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it'd be an amazing opportunity, um, an amazing opportunity for the kids, too. Yeah. Um, my aunt just came to visit from Argentina, and she got the kids messy jerseys. I've got my messy jersey. Uh, just got to get my husband one now, and we can all, we're all ready for, oh, for it. Oh, I love it. So, yeah. I love it. Hopefully yeah. it makes it out here. I know, I don't think they're in the same I don't think conference. they're in the same conference, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so maybe but eventually. You just have to just go to Miami. Yeah, go to Miami. Miami's Why a fun not? place. Of course. <laughs> so I want I want to talk a little bit about your background. Yeah. You you mentioned you worked in tourism. Yes. I, I'd love to know what that looked like, and then how did you make the switch over to partner marketing? Yeah, you know, um, I worked at a, you know, I I started my career uh, at a place called Carlson Companies uh, out in Minneapolis. So I had the opportunity to take this role um, in in communications and uh, really working for the the first for the the biggest travel agency um, franchise in in America hmm. and um, so that really got me into the first step of that career in tourism and then that there was an opportunity within the, the organization as we started uh, an agency to really work on tourism boards hmm. and, and helping tourism boards, you know, increase their arrival numbers. So we were doing marketing, advertising, and public relations for those organizations. And so um, I spent over, what, 15 years doing that. Um, and as you can imagine, a lot of a lot of where you get your your your, your big bang for your box is, is through the wholesalers and working, you know, at a B2B type of uh, level. And so we did a lot of um, groundwork to, to build momentum around countries like Kenya. Hmm. Um, you know, we worked we worked all over the place, Peru, uh, Patagonia. Uh, and then obviously the great state of Louisiana. We did all of the Mississippi River oh. uh, states all, all up. Um, you know, so we did states, we did it all. Um, yeah. uh, we, we even worked in uh, overseas in, in Asia with, with Taiwan, uh, not Taiwan, yes, Taiwan was one of them. Um, so we were all over the place. Wow, did so. you get to travel a lot as part of that? I traveled almost all of my career. Yeah, yeah. Wow. and that, that was very hard. Uh, now, when I, when I, my husband uh, ended up getting a job at Google, mm -hmm. and I had started my own marketing firm, uh, doing very much what we were doing uh, at Carlson, and um, so I was able to move, and so we moved out here. And I kept doing what I was doing, and then I ended up building uh, a mar uh, sorry a travel tech uh, company with a colleague, a former colleague of mine. Oh, cool! Did that for three years. Um, 
raised a bunch of money, built some really cool tech, um, so got who, pregnant. Who, who were you selling to? With the so we were actually selling to um, hotels okay. as well as um, as tr travel agents. Okay. And so yeah. travel agencies, yeah. we, we were building a, kind of a multi-destination uh, portal for agents to actually build a whole itinerary with multi stops. Oh, okay, cool. Um, but it was all luxury travel, yeah. so a lot of stuff that wasn't online at the time, mm -hmm. uh, safari lodges, etc. We did a lot of yeah. work in Africa, so um, you know it, it, the, the pricing model didn't work in what what was available to yeah. the market then. So, yeah, very cool. so it was very cool. Yeah, nice. and then and you got pregnant. Then I got pregnant, and then Changed I got everything. pregnant again. Uh, <laughs> uh, nine months later, I had another surprise. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, it was fine with one, but then um, when we found out we were having the next, it was it was time to to probably call it quits because yeah. uh, you know the the travel schedule just was not kind yeah. to oh, the yeah. family, and so how many how many months apart are they? They're fifteen months. Okay, yeah. I, I have four, fourteen okay, months. Okay, so first you know two. you know you know yeah. the pain. The second one came a little faster than we thought too. Like, <laughs> yeah. <it's> like, <laughs> We took we took our time on the third one. We're like we got to smart. Slow down a you learned you learned a lesson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have three. I stopped at two. <laughs> but the, tra the travel with the kids is hard. It's hard. I remember being pregnant with my first and going to South Africa, and being on that flight and and thinking, oh, what am I doing? I'm just so sick, you know. Um, yeah. But you just had to do it. You, had, yeah. you know, two weeks of sales calls. Yeah. You know, I was Ubering all over South South Africa, and that at that time Uber was new, and it was great. Yeah. Uber was a, a godsend at that really? time. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because I didn't have to run a car. Yeah. So how long did you keep the travel up with the kids? Uh, you know, I would say, I think I I ended up moving on and 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 I want to say it was probably a month into after finding out. Yeah. Georgie was on her way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So. And then how did you make the switch over to partner marketing? Well, that's a longer story. Um, <laughs> so I won't tell the long story. Um, I, I took a break. I, yeah. I mothered uh, and, and did that for a little bit of time. And then, you know, being in Silicon Valley and having a little taste of tech, I wanted to get back into things. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a good stay at home mom. I know that for myself. And, and I, I commend all mothers out there, I think it's amazing um, work and it's really hard. It's the most um, thankless job I've ever seen. It is the most thankless yeah. and it is the most tiresome and challenging job. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I realized I, I was not fit for it. Uh, so I started to search <laughs> and it, I had a very humbling experience, you know, of uh, going from growing in one career to now just trying to find my way through tech. Yeah. And um, uh, so it took a long time, about nine months of, of searching and trying to find the right fit. Uh, and then one day, you know, I, I got a bunch of job offers that were good, mm -hmm. right? That were I was I was after, and and I had to make a decision. And ServiceNow was one of them. Um, and at that time, the role was for an account-based marketing person to help with their global integrated campaigns team build out a, a bit of an infrastructure around hmm. our our CSM product, our our customer uh, service management product. So and not partner marketing. Focus. It was not partner okay. marketing. It was like mass marketing. Yeah, yeah. You know, but trying to pr provide an ABM light yeah. scenario to that. And so uh, I did that for about six months until I got um, I took a, a role f within the ABM team uh, to do one to one marketing mm -hmm. with our biggest um, with our biggest customers or potential customers so that we could land those deals. Um, nice. So yeah, so I, that was awesome because you know four years straight we got to work on I got to work on teams that landed the biggest you know oh, deals cool. of the organization yeah. learned a lot about the business and learned a lot about deal making um, and um, then also got exposed to Accenture and Deloitte um, who were who were some of those accounts and um, so you were you were targeting those accounts we were targeting those got accounts yeah. so that that was uh, what we call an mm. on now customer so the, the Accenture on now Deloitte on now um, and 
that's when I got a little taste and flavor for what the partner um, environment really was about and how challenging mm -hmm. it is, but also how fruitful it can be. So uh, I started knocking on the door of the VP of partner marketing and I kept knocking and I kept knocking and she kept saying, I don't have any headcount. I don't have any headcount. And one day I saw, um, I saw plans for the following year and I saw a headcount and I <laughs> knocked on the door <laughs> and uh, I, I went for a role and that was uh, to help out with the Deloitte account and uh, become the partner marketer for, for, for Deloitte. Uh, cool. And that's really how it all started. Wow. Yeah. And, and you know, just looking at your LinkedIn, it's been an upward progression for you on the partner mm -hmm. side. It has, luckily, yeah. Yeah, well, what advice do you have for people that are find themselves right now knocking on the door and they, yeah. they want to they progress and they want to move up? Yeah. What advice do you have for them? Don't give up. Yeah. You're going to fall flat on your face. You're going you're gonna to have really hard days. You're going to get no a lot. And you, you have to just plow through and you have to be positive and you have to focus on the future. Forget the past, but learn from it, right? Mm -hmm. And, and take, take in all of the feedback that you're getting from those no's and tweak and, you know, do more research and do the work. Yeah. You know, I, I think being humble and doing the work and um, being patient. I, I, I'm, I've always been of the belief of, of, you know, things happen when they need to happen. Um, the right opportunities come and those, those bad opportunities or the wrong opportunities don't happen because it's not a right fit. Yeah. And you can find moments of desperation um, when you're down and I know a lot of people right now are having really tough times. They're either just getting laid off, they're, they've been laid off and they're still looking, um, or they're potentially going to be getting laid off. Yeah. Um, and my, my recommendation is to plan, to network, to work any and every area of um, of your friend system and and people that you have worked with, mentored, or have m been a mentee of, you know, use those resources. Hmm. Yeah, it, you know, the patience thing is something I've had to work at really hard yeah. in my career because I'm not a very patient person. I'm, no one is. I'm Irish. I'm Type yeah. A. I'm like, let's go. And <laughs> and I've had times in my career where I've I've had to take huge step backs. Yeah. You know, I've I've been very fortunate. Never been laid off. Never been fired. But I've had leadership roles taken away from yeah. me. I've had teams taken away from me. And you know, nothing personal. It was just organizational changes. Yeah. But you know, when you're leading a team of six, and all of a sudden you go back to being an individual sales rep contributor, like that, that's a huge hit. Yeah. It's a huge hit to the ego. It's you know, you start questioning your your, your skills, your confidence, and Frankly, I was enjoying what I was doing, and right. you know, and I had to be—I had to learn patience. It's—it's it's not just patience, but it's—I think there's also a level of pragmatism in business that we need to also learn. Um, you said it's—it's it's not personal. That's yeah. exactly right. It's not personal. Oftentimes, it's about the bottom line, or it's the wrong fit. Yeah. You know, and and sometimes you have to also learn that maybe this wasn't the right fit for what you're best at, yeah. right? And, you know, some people love to lead and they're really good at it. Some people love to lead and they're really bad at it. Yeah. Um, and some people, you know, love being an IC. Some people hate it. Yeah. And so it's, it's again, I, I think it's just finding that right space. Um, and, you know, also always looking, right? Finding that passion that can keep driving you, you know, I. I sought out these roles. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't let them fall in my lap, right? And, and having a roadmap for yourself is super important because if you don't, um, no one's going to write it for you. Interesting. I, I would be curious how many people I would ask to actually have a roadmap for themselves. That's you know? critical. Yeah. I, and I, I like to think I have one. I had one up to this point, but I'm not sure confidently I have one after this point. Which I is fair. I worked really hard to get to where I am now, but I'm not confident I have a roadmap. So that might be something I need to think about yeah. more. Well, and it it doesn't always have to be a professional roadmap, yeah. right? And sometimes, you know, you get to a point, 
that you're okay where you're at, yeah. you know, and, and that's okay, right? As long as you're contributing, you know, and, and you're thinking and you're evolving and you're being innovative in your space, there should be no reason for somebody to say, ah, he's, you know, he's outdated. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. I want to ask you more about the, the networking mm -hmm. side of things because I think that's that's huge, especially in the partner marketing space. Yeah. What, what do you do to network or, or how would you advise people to, to expand their network? I think it's it's critical, you know, um, I tell my team, like, get out there and go to the conferences, not just, you know, not just a partner marketing conference or, or, or an alliance or channels conference. You know, there's a lot that we can learn from other marketers. We can learn from our partners, mm -hmm. right? And I think our partners have a lot to teach us in how they work and how they want to work. Um, what they'll let us do and what they won't let us do, you know. Yeah. Um, and so just constantly exposing yourself and asking your teams um, and asking your peers if you're afraid to go do something to, to be a, you know, be a, a partner in crime and, yeah. and go, go somewhere. Because I know that that can be challenging. But we're all so competitive, you know. Um, that sometimes I find certain people are so shy to share, mm -hmm. um, and I say shy in 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 a nice way. Um, you know, they don't want to share because they they don't want to open up the kimono. But the reality is, is that when you do, you know, I, I believe in the words trust and be trusted. Yeah. Right. Um, if you show trust, you know, you will gain trust uh, back, and and you can learn. A, a mountainous amount of information and you can save yourself a lot of pain and agony um, if you share with your peers and with your competitors as well you, you just get better right yeah, um, yeah. but some people are a little bit different in that in that sense I, I like to share yeah I do too and I, I find being in person makes it easier to share and yeah. I think that's been one of my challenges during COVID is everything went virtual yeah and I mean, a lot of challenges came out of that that world, but you know, what we're finding, at least within our sales org, it's it's you have some people that are resistant to leaving that virtual world and going getting back out right. there, and I think that's so crucial for our industry. Yeah, you know. So, what are you guys doing to to get back out there and 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 help people like me network? What what you know? What's on the docket for Foundry? Well, we you know we've been doing these biannual. Uh, Partner Marketing Executive Dinner is the one, mm -hmm. the one you attended, and, and that's been a huge hit for us because, you know, we, we had one lady attend, and uh, she gave me some feedback afterwards in that she thought it was going to be a vendor event, right? You mm -hmm. show up at a dinner, we do a presentation, it's kind of soft pitching, oh, and it's pure, you know, networking, and she's like, it was, it was not that at all. It was 100% right. pure event, yeah. which is what we wanted. We wanted to be the facilitator of a very valuable networking dinner, and I thought it was, you know, a lot of fun in terms of just getting people together. We even had competitors there, big yeah. cloud competitors, yeah. and you know, no one's sharing secrets, but like, what's working, what's not working in the industry. And yeah. so, you know, we're we're doing. We did one in Boston. We're doing one in San Francisco. That's great. We're going to hopefully do one in London this oh, year, and excellent. then maybe we'll add Singapore next year. So, you know, but those are just points in time. And you know, my thought with this podcast is like, let's do that more of an evergreen model. Let's every other week sit down with someone like yourself and share advice yeah. and you know talk about careers and what's working and not working yeah. and my my thought with this podcast was it has to be in person yeah don't want to do virtual 100%. I, I won't I won't be as good I right. won't share as much I don't think people will share as no. much you're right you know? you're right and if you, you know it's funny because um, our our VP of, of of the partner side of the house is of the partner ecosystem Erica Vellini talks a lot about intimacy yeah. and creating intimacy with with our partners and I do think that those those in person opportunities are so critical right because again that trust and be trusted yeah. um, that allows that opportunity to, to shine right as you share things that you normally wouldn't with people um, over zoom or, or wherever yeah I think that's huge on the partner yeah. side too because you know you, you guys are in it to win it together yeah right and yeah if you don't have that trust, it's going to be really hard to work together. One hundred percent. So, yeah. t so tell me more about your role, your current role at ServiceNow. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, 
You know, last year we, we went through a massive evolution with, with our partner marketing team. A lot of people say we're in our teenage phase. I would say we're in our post-toddler phase. I think. <laughs> <laughs> we still have a long way to go. Up, growing pretty fast to be <laughs> post-toddler. But. Well, when I say post-toddler, it's for, specifically for the partner yeah. you know, ecosystem and, and the partner marketing ecosystem. You know, we were when I say we were lean and mean, you know, five years ago, I think there were just like, three people on, on the team. Wow. I, I want to say that that's true. Um, I'm pretty sure that might be one extra. <laughs> there was maybe just yeah, two people. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So um, we have grown, um, even though we are still tiny uh, and we're still learning. Uh, and how, how many years were you on the partner side through this? this so period? I've been on the partner marketing side, I think about two Two years, okay. two and a half so years. So you've experienced some of this yes. expansion and growth, and correct, yeah. yeah. And it's and it's been really interesting. Um, there's been a lot of success. There's been a lot of failure. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's it's been good because the reality is is that we have many stakeholders, mm-hmm. not just our partners, but internally we have stakeholders like you know our ACE team, which is our you know alliances, channels, and ecosystems um, teams, which is the business side of of the house and our sales side of the house. And then, you know, we have our field marketing teams, we have our regional partner marketing teams all rolling up into different areas of of the company. Um, And, you know, so it does, it it does get challenging. And there are conflicting uh, KPIs when you're building out programs and, you know, partners, were never something that we grew up with at ServiceNow. You know, we grew organically. We mm-hmm. grew the business massively in an organic fashion, and partners were more of those folks that would come in and do the servicing and all that good stuff, uh, sometimes deployment and implementation. Mm-hmm. Um, but now, more than ever, as, as, we, as we try to grow the business, at this exponential rate, we we know the the need for partner is the most critical area for success hmm. for the business, and so there is a hyper focus on on partner uh, within the organization, and you know we are being led by a, an extremely um, eloquent and and tenacious leader with Erica. Uh, and now we've, you know, from a partner marketing side, we've brought in a former SAP, you know, just mega star <laughs> in Megan in Megan Moore. So uh, it's been it's been great to see that evolution, yeah. um, and to see the maturity, right, of of where we need to be, uh, and and really start to understand and dissect. Which areas of the business? Because you know, partners. There's so many different types of partners um, that will help us reach certain goals. So we want to make sure that we're we're building the right types of engagements mm-hmm. and opportunities from a marketing perspective with the right partners, um, so that we can you know create that exponential um, you know hit to the to the market right and. Yeah. and and let people under, really understand the power of our platform um, through the expertise of the partner. Now, it, it sounds great that they've adopted that kind of partner-first approach and, and putting the value in there. Do you have to also sell the value back internally? And Because and, I've heard that as a common challenge of like, hey, we're delivering value over here. We do have ROI, but sometimes they don't really see it. <laughs> I laugh because they don't see it because it's so hard to measure. You know, we talk about, um, you know, at ServiceNow, we have, you know, ServiceNow-led activity, we have joint activity, and we have partner-led activity. Mm-hmm. And it all looks different. And, yeah. it, and, and you know, that partner-led activity is really, excuse me, it, the partner-led activity to me is the most valuable and the most challenging, right? Because that's where you're having partners really stand um, and and help build uh, a business proposition and a, a point of view mm-hmm. into the market, right? Um, and and it's because they believe in the power of of what they're building, um, and and with that, they're the ones kind of going to market on our behalf. Uh, that said, 
when they do go to market, um, it's impossible for us to actually measure the yeah. impact of that unless you have really strong relationships with that partner. Hmm. And you know, when when I worked with the the big you know SIs, my big focus was how do we create really intimate relationships with our car, with our counterparts on on their side, the, those partner marketers, both on the global side as well as the regional side, so that we're working as one team. Hmm. We're identifying where we win, where we win together, and where they win because we're still gonna do these things, that yeah. we win and they win, but we're also gonna wanna really focus on where we win together. Um, the, the we and the, the us is easier to identify uh, from a measurement and metrics perspective than the they. And you know, with PII data being what it is today, uh, you know, we, we have limitations on how we share and how we identify yeah. our success. Um, I'm lucky to have operations under um, my team, and so we're really starting to, to f find a way to at least measure the impact within the accounts that we're working with our partners um, and, and at least be able to deliver in some metrics and show the, the power of what the partner's doing, hmm. um, which I think is important. Kind of goes back to your ABM yeah, days, right? Yeah, you have to. Yeah. Yeah, and we're actually using a lot of the measurements that we built for ABM in the partner side. Interesting. Now. Yeah, I you know it's just fascinating as as advanced Martech, how advanced it's been, and mm -hmm. all the tools out there. And <laughs> on the partner side, it, it sounds nothing. like it comes back, but it just comes <laughs> back to just good old relationships. And yeah. the stronger relationship you have with that partner, the more likely you are going to be in a position to get that information back you need to yeah. measure and show success. Well, and also, you know, nurture the leads that you get in. And, yeah. and you know, like build the business. <laughs> that could be a whole other podcast. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the whole point of what we're trying to do is, is you know, build business, yeah. right? Sell, um, and not sell, but really build out build out the awareness of what it is that we can do together as an alliance and yeah. and 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 help people really understand how our platform along with the expertise of the partner um, joined up can can create you know a 10x return on investment because that's really what happens mm -hmm. um, especially when you have someone like the like an Accenture or a Deloitte or an EY, KPMG, those guys that really understand the businesses that they're working in and understand how the, they're architected um, from a technology perspective, that is where you know the power really comes in because yeah. they're the ones making the suggestions on how to build this the right way. Hmm. And and you know obviously you spend a lot of time fostering those relationships, but you mentioned. All these stakeholders internally, yeah. right, whether it's probably field or sales, mm -hmm. do you have to spend a lot of your time there fostering those relationships and getting yes. buy-in? And so yeah. you, you got to juggle a lot of partners internally and externally. That's right, yeah. and you know, but in order to be successful, the awareness and the enablement of those teams is critical. You can see where the enablement has been done, you'll see success. Hmm. Where it hasn't been done you will see failure, hmm. most likely. And, 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 you know, a lot of people say, well, marketing, you know, you're, you should just be, you know, uh, demand generation and, you know, forget about the internal teams. It's not an important thing for, for, for us to focus on. It most certainly is one of the most important things for us to focus on, and not just within one's own organization, but also within the partner organization, hmm. within the lines of business for that partner. Because oftentimes those guys, like a Cal at Accenture, uh, is too busy to even really understand or have time to digest some of the messages we're putting into market um, and really understand what it is the organization can do together. Um, and so, from a stakeholder perspective, yeah, we're we're marketing to all those folks. Hmm. Full time job. Full time job. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it just overwhelms me. I'm just thinking like, all right, I know how many partners you have, and you have these internal partners, and you have sales enablement, and you have programs yeah. and packages. Oh yeah, we need content. content. We got to talk about yeah. nurture. Yeah, and you content. Wear a lot of hats. Yeah, we do. Yeah. And and 
I always say that partner marketing um, is the hardest marketing job that anyone can have within the marketing ecosystem. It is by far the hardest, um, but it's also the most fruitful. Um, and it's, it, I think the, the people that do really well at it, is, it are those folks that really know how to maneuver through s s you know, all of the, I keep talking about nuance, the nuance yeah. of all of those stakeholders that you need, you need, you know, buy-in from. Yeah. Even just to build a program, right? Um, you need your sales teams to, to buy in and believe that the partners are going to actually help them build a bigger deal, for example. You know, how do you do that? when you've got territorial feelings yeah. sometimes with some of the sales teams. Do you have any you know, successes working with sales? Like, What advice do you have yeah, out there Yeah, we have people? some amazing yeah. success stories. That, that's a big challenge for a lot of partner teams, right? Is, it's a, it is, and you know, I think you know, for the sales teams out there that aren't leveraging partners, the reality is, is that if you think about it, not only does the partner help you build a bigger deal because they have the relationships, the C-suite level, mm -hmm. um, but they also have the relationships at the at the business and technical level, and understand the architectural infrastructure of that organization from mm -hmm. a technology side, right? So they know where the gaps are, and they know where the gaps are at an uh, at a full organizational level, right? Versus, you know, if, if we've got a sales team that's focused on selling risk or, you know, security or HR, you know, they're little small pockets. Yeah. And when you get, you know, a partner who has that expertise within those businesses that they're working with and consulting with, that's where they start to identify the massive gaps that could be actually filled in a really oil, you know, it creates that well-oiled machine of yeah. saying, okay, we can do this, we can sell you this, and you can, you can implement this, but it's, it's only going to be a Band-Aid for, you know, a bigger problem. Yeah. And that's what we want to avoid, right? Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because with ServiceNow, you know, we, we, we were born out of being an IT ticketing tool, and now we we cross the entire business in terms of automating and you know creating much better experiences for for customers and for employees. And people still don't realize that yeah. we 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 span the gamut in terms of a platform, and it's one platform. So that interconnectedness and that interwoven you know, tissue is, is all there. Um, so it makes it much more seamless. And so that's where the partner comes in to really help the sales team and coach the sales teams into identifying that. Um, you know, it does build, build a bigger deal. Yeah. yeah. It takes longer. Yeah. It takes longer, but you know, the payoff's definitely worth it. Got to educate the sales team. And I, we, we were actually working on that yesterday. So our sister company, IDC, Right, we we had them in yesterday and trying to just convince our sales team they should be partnering more with IDC on deals because at the end of the day we think it drives more value to our customers, right? Because sure. you know you're you're buying analyst content, you're working with Foundry to reach CIOs. Like, yeah. let's bring this together and just trying to get them to realize like this is a more strategic conversation. You know, likely going to be bigger deals. Like, there's a lot of benefits, but you got to educate the sales team. Yeah, and you know sometimes. You know, I manage sales reps for a living. Sometimes they just think they know everything. <laughs> yes, they do. Yes, they do. And sometimes they do know yeah, everything. Yeah. You know, um, again, being being um, being someone who likes to learn, I think you, having that open mind around um, understanding and listening, and giving giving it a chance, giving whatever it is a chance. Yeah. Um, you can actually surprise yourself with what you get out of it. I want to ask you about the, the global nature of yeah. your role. So what does that look like in terms of working with the global partner marketing organization? A lot of hours. <laughs> <laughs> Early calls, late calls. Early calls, yeah. late calls, um, you know, middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I have to put my glasses on because I'm typing on my on my cell phone and I can't oh. see anything. Um, no, I mean, overall, it, it it's super... I would say it's so fruitful, right? Because each of these regions work so differently. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and you know the way that the nature in which we're set up is you know we have a global organization and then you know we have our regional organizations that roll into our fields and enterprise teams and so um, that is also a bit of a handshake and um, mm. a negotiation. We, we need to negotiate with them to, to help us activate. Um, we have to negotiate with them as we build out bigger global uh, um, points of view mm -hmm. uh, and campaigns. Will they take them or will they leave them? Uh, and you know, the way that we restructured this year is we now will not build content if it won't be used by two of our regions hmm. um, okay. because we don't want um, content wear <laughs> like shelfware we just we, we we can't we can't do that anymore yeah uh, and and we want to make sure that if we're building anything it's because the market's asking for it and the sales teams need it uh, so so that's really the perspective we've taken with with the regions. Now, my role in particular was born out of the challenge we had last year of of you know we were working oftentimes in parallel. Um, we were cannibalizing mm -hmm. a lot of each other's work. I see that um, so often. Yeah. In the market, especially from a global perspective. Yeah. And just teams competing with each other, not even realizing it. Well, and, and it's insane to think about how much money and investment goes in uh, when when people are doing that, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you think, what are we what are we doing? Wait, you did that? You did yeah, that? Right? No, wait, I had a call just yesterday where three people did the same thing. <laughs> and I I kind of looked up and rolled my eyes and said, All right, back to the Well that's why back, you're here. Back, you're help, back. You're help, helping yeah. put it to an end, right? Trying, trying, yeah. yeah. It, and it's hard and in, in such a large organization, you know, within large enterprises you have all these different pockets of people trying to do the right thing, mm -hmm. right? Um, the thing is, is you know, we need to connect. We, you know, we need to talk to each other, and you need to show up, and um, and you need to share. And those are those are big things that sometimes people don't do, and that's what ends up happening is, is we we end up again cannibalizing the work that we're doing and um, confusing the market sometimes. Yeah. Now, as you work with with more folks globally to get on the same page, do you find you kind of run in more to, towards like decision, you know, decision by committee, you know, you move a little bit slower. You know, what's it like as you bring more people in as you still try to be nimble and fast and, and get things done? It's a great question. Um, I ask because we, we, we go through the same thing internally. It's, it's yeah, challenge. I mean, power by committee, um, it's, it's, it's great uh, and it's great to have the inputs, but you know, I think it's so important to have um, Executive stakeholders that are decision makers Got it. Um, to move to move things along. Yeah. And so while everyone should have a voice and have a point of view, um, and those should be digested, uh, there still needs to be a group of people or a steer co that actually helps drive a program along or an initiative along. And um, so I, I I do think that. Yeah, it's so I'm all about bringing people to the table. Yeah. Because you need to hear all the potential pitfalls of, of an idea. Mm -hmm. um, that said, not everyone should have the ability to you know, cut something out or, you know, yeah. or, or or just walk away from it because that's not what we're trying to do. We're just yeah. trying to, you know, and and there has to be, you know, phase 1, phase 2, phase 3. After phase one, what worked, what didn't? Where do we have to, you know, pivot if we need to, or do we have to, you know, just change one small tactic? It's not working, right? No, that makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, you have like a global feedback loop, but you're you're being very strategic on the decision making powers. Yeah, gotta fail fast. Yeah, gotta fail fast and just move forward. Speaking, right? all right. Speaking of failing fast, yeah. have you taken a lot of risks? Do you think partner markers out there should be taking risks, especially in in, in this market? Hundred percent. Yeah. I am the for me calculated risk is exactly where we need to all be headed for success. Hmm. You know, if if you want to try anything new, um, if you're not a, if you're risk averse, you're never gonna you're never gonna surprise people. Yeah. You know, you're never gonna wow people, and and I think. Uh, the whole point of what we do as marketers is to leave an impact, right? 
and, and leave a positive impact that allows people to understand better what it is you're doing, right? Or what the company is doing or yeah. the alliance is doing um, and how it can help them, right, as a customer. And so um, if, if you don't take risks, if you don't put new things in market, if you don't if you if you take yourself too seriously, that's another one. We like to have fun, <laughs> yeah. or, or, and we like to have a lot of fun. Um, you know, you're just you're just another uh, boring white paper. I'll yeah. say, you know, yeah. and we don't want to be a boring white paper. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Should title this podcast. Don't be a boring white Don't paper. Don't be a boring white paper. Well, welcome to my risk. This, <laughs> this is this is me taking a risk with this podcast. Yeah, I love know. it. I uh a little nervous, you know. No, don't be nervous. We'll, we'll see, this is awesome. We'll see how uh, people listen to it. I but, love uh, it. I, you know, I gotta give you guys the credit. I mean, getting great guests like you on the show's really helped. And you know, I, I what's what's baffled me is just the excitement I've gotten from the guests of just bringing another guest. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I I had one did one yesterday and he's looping in a colleague from another company and it's like, you gotta be on this show. So yes. maybe, maybe people actually like it. <laughs> I, I'm happy to provide some recommendations. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, listen, the more, like I said, the more we share, the more we learn from each other yeah. um, and the more we evolve, right? We have to just get to the point where we are giving ourselves the opportunity to um, better what we do and provide more transparency around how we are winning um, in the market, uh, and you know th the impact that a power that that a partner can can provide is it, it's not visible today mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. So, so thinking about evolving, you yeah. know, coming out of this year, looking at next year, mm -hmm. what excites you most about next year? And that could be technologies, strategies, things in the market, events kind of leave it up to you yeah I mean first things first we've been doing a ton of work um, there's a there's a fabulous person on my team Sharon Oqua who is just a bulldog around operations and she is is really starting to build our ability to actually see a lot of the partner-led activity mm. um, and and so I'm I'm really excited to see what that looks like um, and, and provide that visibility to our C-suite so that they really understand um, the investment uh, within partner marketing itself, that tiny investment and what that actually results in from, mm. from you know, the ability not only to close deals but actually to renew, to keep the customers happy, um, to keep them you know, up to date on their um, on their upgrades, right? Uh, I, I want to be able to show all that information. So that's one. Um, and I think you know, next year there's going to be a heavy focus around you know creating stronger trust with our customers, our partners, and you know our teams, mm -hmm. right? And um, bringing bringing those three three groups together uh, and and in different ways uh, and you know I'm, I'm excited to see how that how that kind of starts to evolve um, yeah can I, that can that happen in a virtual world like does it and the reason why I ask that is because I know a lot of a lot of partner marketing organizations have have T and E cut right now and people can't mm -hmm. go see partners yeah. and, and can't fly out and go to conferences and I think a little bit's coming back but I mean it, I, I see it tight at a lot of companies. It's tight and yeah. it's it's tight on the partner side. Yeah. I mean we've had some of our top partners last year not be able to go you know not, not get everybody to our knowledge which is our you know our, our big annual event Yeah. and you know that, that and this is a company that's spending a ton of money with us and they yeah. can't get people to actually be there um, so listen there can we do it sure we can is it is it gonna result in the same type of experience that we're having now yeah. no will it be as memorable no yeah. um, so you know one of the things that we're trying to do is how do we localize a lot of a lot of the activity that we're we're trying to drive and be hmm. more strategic around identifying those pockets of, of um, 
opportunities with a with an alliance um, so that we can kind of be a little bit more hyper focused uh, with specific customers or potential customers um, so that you know they're sharing their learnings and you know one of the things that we do at knowledge every year is really focus on the customer mm -hmm. and help the customers tell their stories and we're trying to do the very same thing with our partner set and and you probably know this it's almost impossible sometimes um, especially depending on some of those topics yeah. bringing people into a room to share how they did something isn't always easy right yeah um, but as we grow, um, we we get more of these. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> we get more of these organizations that are actually more willing and asking us to tell their story because they're such powerful stories. Hmm. Um, so, so yeah. So that's I think where I'm excited for us to head. We're also you know really refining our our P, a, a PMO model a PDF model, mm -hmm. getting better at our PMC so that we can really leverage that partner-led um, motion. So yeah, there's there's a lot that I think I'm looking forward to next year, a lot of activity. And we're going to be growing um, within the organization. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> 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 so we're, we're excited about that. We're hiring right now. That's great. Yeah. And, you know, we've, we've managed to get more funding, too. So we finally, I think, um, got the ear of the C-suite uh, yeah. to, to pay attention to this, to this small side of the business. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's awesome. I love, I love the idea of, all right, I might not be able to send everybody out there, but that doesn't mean I can't do creative local things to drive 100%. engagement. And, yeah. and the thing with the stories, I mean, especially when I think about, you know, the ServiceNow platform and product, that can do so much, you really need those stories to bring it to life. Yeah. And, but it can be a challenge to get customers to tell those stories. But. Well, and that's where the enablement, I think, especially with the field teams, right? Like, I, I think people still, marketers all up. If I were to go to our org marketing organization and say, do you know what partner marketers do? They'd be like, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. I just know that you work with a partner. Yeah. They don't even know the difference between the partner um, as a customer yep. or the partner. Mm. So, you know, um, that enablement, especially in the areas where we're trying to grow with specific partners, is, is, is so critical um, to help the marketers learn how to um, work with a partner, um, market with a partner, and engage uh, on events and, mm -hmm. and things like that. I think that's going to help us expand our power um, just, you know, tenfold. That's great. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Well, Maisa, as we wrap up, same question for you that I ask everybody. What is one piece of advice that you'd leave for partner marketers out there? Oh, I forgot you asked me this question <laughs> before. Um, I would say the one piece of advice is to always – to always be listening and to always ask questions and um, and to assess where the opportunities really are. Um, a lot of people have great ideas, um, but really identifying where the business is and mm -hmm. where we should be putting our marketing dollars isn't always the same as where the business is building with the partner, right? And so I think partner marketing you, you know, you said you were getting dizzy with how much work we have. Um, the It's so critical for us to focus on where we are ready to go to market, mm -hmm. right? Otherwise, don't spend the money and, you know, don't spend the cycles. Yeah, well, I think we can always be listening more and asking more questions, so I love that. Yeah, So focus. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming on. Rick, this is, this great. is a pleasure. Uh, thank a you for the opportunity. Fun. I'm having a great time with your with your Moscow meal. <laughs> uh, your your bartending skills are Cheers. still on. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. <laughs>